of our teachers and what? We'll see if he changes. Okay. Good evening and thank you. Uh, welcome to all of us and uh, our one lone body out there in the audience um, and those watching from home. It is Thursday, May 13th, 2021, and this is a regular scheduled meeting of the uh, Burnsville Egan Savage Independent School District 191. Um, call it to order and Director Alt, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll begin with... Um, First item tonight is to approve tonight's agenda. May I have a motion for the approval of agenda? So moved. Moved by Director Werb. May I have a second? Second. Seconded by Director Chester. Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Hume? Aye. Honor? Aye. Chester? Aye. Miller? Aye. Alt? Aye. Werb? Aye. The motion of approval of the agenda passes tonight. So we will now move into the information section of the meeting with a report about van advanced learning K through eight. Tonight's speaker on this to topic will be Amina Afadel, Dr. Janet Golden, Franny Bicur, and John Bonneville. Welcome all. I will turn it over to whoever's beginning to speak tonight. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Miller, members of the board, uh, Dr. Battle. Uh, we're very uh, excited to uh, be able to just share uh, some of the work that's being done with uh, supporting the needs of our advanced learners. Slide. So our purpose here tonight is to, to uh, share with you what's happening at each level um, we'd like to share what's uh, our advanced learning specialist in the elementary, the services they are being, they're providing, uh, an update on our Universal Plus grant to support our identification for our students in, uh, for gifted and talented, the middle school embedded honors program, and uh, a quick look at our college credit courses. Slide. Uh, Dr. Golden. Um, I'm going to start here and then uh, just to show that uh, one of the reasons we wanted to uh, really focus on our advanced learners uh, as part of our pathway schools was to address the big uh, goals that we had for equity, access, and rigor for all students. And so uh, with this continuum, you can see at a glance the types of services that are being provided to students at each of those grade levels. Bye. mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this year we had three advanced learning specialists serving second grade through fifth grade students in our elementary buildings and virtual academy. These services began in November during full distance learning and have continued throughout the school year. All advanced learning services this year have been delivered virtually. We served about 260 students across the district with curriculum centered on critical thinking and research skills during the daily win, what I need time. We also had an advanced math class for students in grades three, four, and five. This class covered grade level content and then went deeper into mathematical thinking and reasoning skills. We have served about 90 students across the district with these virtual math classes. Per the requirements of the Universal PLUS grant, we also tested all second grade students and third grade students without previous scores using the Cognitive Abilities Test. The, the COGAT is one of the data points that is used to identify advanced learning students. 
The advanced learning specialists were also involved in student identification, creating curriculum, and professional development. I'd like to acknowledge the work of our three advanced learning specialists, Sharon Stalock, Erin Huber, and Sarah Petrella. Their work this year has been an enormous effort in using technology for instruction, creating virtual lessons, student identification, communicating with classroom teachers, and developing curriculum. Next year, we will have four advanced learning specialists. Services will be provided in person and virtually, and curriculum writing will continue with the addition of student research projects that align with the four pathways. Bye. Dr. Bonneville? So as this slide describes, uh, ISD 191 is a recipient of the Universal Plus grant from the state of Minnesota. And the, <clears throat> this grant is a three-year grant awarded uh, to support our efforts to provide our students with equitable practices evaluating culturally responsive identification and services to historically under, underserved gifted populations. My work has been, um, has been to support how we apply this grant to our work related to our Pathways vision. Uh, we have done this in the following three areas professional development, scratch creative compu uh, computing, and student identification. So first, professional development. All second and third grade teachers are working through uh, professional development developed to create dialogue and understanding related to students' identification for gifted service. Additionally, all um, grade two and three teachers were provided training to implement scratch computer coding through mouse curriculum to implement in the classrooms to ignite interest in computer science and align with our pathways model. Second, the scratch uh, creative computing. Um, all of our second and third grade students participated in scratch creative computing, computing weekly to develop coding skills and build technology interest through inquiry, sharing and collaboration with peers through the creation of scratch coding projects at the elementary level. And then lastly, student identification. Um, all of our, uh, all of grade, as uh, Dr. Golden uh, shared, all second and third grade students participate in COGAT testing, and, and we use the data points to measure progress as well as identification of our students for, uh, uh, for programming. Teachers also performed a teacher observation survey to identify student progress and interest in uh, computer coding. And then furthermore, students are completing a pre and post uh, student computer science attitude and interest survey to measure increased interest in um, our computer science programming. Thank you. Slide. Um, Ms. Becker. And with middle school embedded honors, which we began this year, um, with uh, the shift to needing to go to virtual learning, um, we had four guiding beliefs that are aligned with the state of Minnesota's definition of gifted ed. And those guiding beliefs are that we have high expectations for all of our students, that we acknowledge that all of our students bring unique talents and assets to the classroom, that we are very focused on making sure that all of our students are college and career ready so that they are able to take um, advantage of all the opportunities that are available to them in high school, and that there is a continuum of services to meet the needs of all of our students. Um, this visual, I think, does a really good job of explaining it, is that we provide services to all students. All students actually participate in honors type lessons. So if you are in a classroom in a middle school, your teacher is going to be using strategies um, to help you increase the criticality that you bring to lesson. So we want to develop the dispositions that students bring for them to engage at um, a deeper level of thought with the materials that are being presented to them. So that is all of our students always have opportunities for differentiation. And then if we start to bring that in a little, some of our students need a little bit more. And so we, when we provide that, for our students, that would be examples of enriched reading. Um, and so one of the things that we brought in this year that our teachers have done an excellent job of implementing in our ELA classes and our social studies classrooms 
is um, an application called News ELA, which provides you the opportunity to, all students can be reading about the same topic, but you can have students reading at four different levels. So you can be reading at grade level, above grade level, and students that need an extra boost, so you can have the same conversation. But some students are um, having the sentences are more complicated and being exposed to more challenging vocabulary words. So um, we have extension activities. Um, and we have um, shifted, our science teachers have participated in over 40 hours of professional development in which they have shifted the way in which they teach science um, for student guided uh, lessons that where the students have an opportunity to um, increase the criticality in which they uh, look at the lesson and explore the concepts in, in the classroom that is based on student needs. And then always there is um, increased complex complexity within all of our lessons. And we continue to work with Pam McDonald, who is a professor um, at Hamlin University that um, helps to guide lessons in gifted education. And she is part of the conversations and ongoing professional development that we have our middle school teachers involved in. Hi. At the high school, we do have additional advanced learner opportunities for our students. Uh, in ninth and 10th grade, we do have honors courses. Uh, and we also uh, provide the opportunity for students to participate in advanced placement courses, um, college in the schools. And just as a note that our college in the schools course offerings at Burnsville High School and at uh, Burnsville Alternative High School are um, credit bearing at the University of Minnesota which uh, is uh, high rigor and uh, offers the students uh, a lot more um, transition, uh, uh, transition for their credits through uh, not only Minsku, but in other, um, other private and uh, public universities outside the, the state of Minnesota. We also offer concurrent enrollment Concurrent enrollment, uh, currently uh, we have agreements with uh, Normandale Community College and Inver Hills Community College, whereas students are um, enrolled uh, and at the community college and taking the courses taught by our teachers um, at the, at the um, high school site. Uh, we also um, uh, offer the Pathways Industry certifications in, um, in uh, multiple fields and uh, give students the opportunity to test into those certifications, uh, including one that I wanna just highlight for this spring, which uh, is not exactly an industry certification, but the bilingual and multilingual skill seals uh, is an opportunity for students to test and be recognized on their transcripts uh, and be eligible for college recognition uh, in multiple languages. Uh, we also uh, have students who take uh, the opportunity to do post-secondary enrollment options known as PSEO, in which they select the uh, post-secondary uh, institution of their choice and uh, enroll there uh, while they are earning their uh, high school credits as well. Slide. So thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, we are continuing to create that pre-K through 12 continuum of services for all of our students, the goal is that equity, access, and rigor, that all students are prepared and successful in uh, rigorous courses that they would choose, that all students have access, that we are breaking down the barriers for students to participate uh, in these rigorous opportunities. And uh, finally, rigor, that we wanna make sure that that is uh, embedded in all of our pre-K through 12 opportunities and learning environments. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Uh, board members, I will now open it up. Uh, if anybody has questions or comments? Director Alt. Thank you, Chair Miller. Um, two questions, or maybe a couple more. Um, so with the, um, the enrichment specialists, um, is it the same group, the same group of four specialists each year um, 
or do they rotate? Um, right now, the staffing assignments are the same for this year as they were for, are they, they'll be the same for next year as well. Um, the the um, four teachers are working with uh, Dr. Golden and uh, Dr. Bonneville to really uh, outline what the service model is supposed to be like for, um, for our uh, elementary students and uh, working with uh, elementary principals. And so the amount of planning and uh, investment of program development that they've done, um, they work very well as a team. And right now we feel as though keeping them in those positions uh, is a valuable is a valuable asset to the program. Awesome. Um, and uh, you mentioned uh, Pam McDonald is someone who's helping with professional development for teachers. How long have we been working with her and, and how long do we expect to continue working with her? Dr. Golden, do you wanna just give a little bit of background on the work that we've done with uh, Pam McDonald? Sure. Uh, Pam started working with us oh, probably three years ago. She started working with the elementary advanced learning specialists, helping us to develop uh, content, helping us to develop a firm identification process, helping us to identify our um, testing protocols that we would use. And then she also has provided some curriculum support to the elementary advanced learning specialists as they have been working on developing their own content and curriculum for service to students. And Franny, maybe you can speak more in depth about the work that she's doing or you're planning for her in, in the future. Yes, so building off of the work that she has done with our elementary, and she is the name that if you ask if there is a consultant that you can work with about embedded honors work, she's the name that is brought up by MDE. So we were fortunate enough that we were already working with her. She's worked with um, several other districts as they have looked to embed honors in middle school. So um, a little bit different in where she doesn't develop curriculum for help us develop curriculum. What she does is she walks us through um, conversations that we should have so that the um, middle school teachers who are content area specialists will take the knowledge that they gain from her and apply that to their curriculum to make adjustments to to their curriculum. So we've already we've had two professional development sessions with her. We have one next Wednesday and we do um, we have summer professional development planned with her and continue to work with her into next year. And as we look to continue our relationship with uh, Pam McDonald uh, into next year, it really is to ensure that our programs have a solid foundation built on best practices and that our teachers, um, especially in the embedded honors program with the core, have the skills necessary to deliver that, um, that uh, extension and enrichment for all students and uh, the increased complexity for additional students. Uh, at that point, we would uh, probably uh, access uh, Pam McDonald in, uh, in more of an evaluation assistant for her to observe what's happening in our classrooms to provide us with feedback of how we can improve them. Great, thank you. And having seen um, our science results over the years, I'm really hopeful that, you know, given the changes that you described in your presentation, um, with the science curriculum and the um, increased rigor and expectations um, for those course specialists. Really hopeful that our, our students will, will fare better um, in understanding science. Um, and then I guess the last question is, you know, obviously we won't be working with Pam McDonald forever. Um, how, do we, how do we know that we're successful? How do we know that, you know, all of this work is going to be sustained with fidelity? Um, we continue to uh, look at it through our ongoing review process. Uh, our curriculum areas continue to do self-study. Uh, for example, science uh, will complete their implementation in the next year, um, and then we will, they'll be on the pathway to self-study. We use the collaborative teams to examine student data. We'll continue to look at, as you uh, referenced, our science uh, standardized uh, assessment results. And um, yeah continue with our observations in the classroom. Great, that's it, thank you. Any other, <clears throat> any other questions or uh, comments from the board members? 
Uh, I did want to ask quickly, um, so as we, um, first of all, once we're out of COVID and sort of back to somewhat normal normalcy, and we bring pathways down to K level, um, talk a little bit about how you, because you touched very briefly on the presentation, talk a little bit of how you, you know, vision the advanced learning environment interfacing with the pathways. Um, Maybe even just you know a couple of uh, examples of things you and you you know not necessarily promises but way things you see, you can see programs happening and such. Sure. Um, so for pre-K and K and one, um, as the students are very young and developing and coming from many different um, backgrounds, we hesitate to do high-level uh, identification for gifted and talented. Um, because the students change so very much and it really isn't uh, seen as best practice, except in the cases of some really high level giftedness that can be identified. Our advanced learning specialist will be um, able to observe classrooms, individual students who work with the teachers in both pre-K and K and one to, um, to uh, embed rigor into their play activities, um, to uh, identify and support students' exploratory and inquiry. Uh, and then at second grade, we do the identification, the first level of identification with the COGAT and uh, begin to provide some more direct services in those days. Yeah, sorry, maybe I, I didn't clarify my question. I was actually more interested in um, not necessarily down at the K level, but we were bringing the pathways from eight all the way down. So definitely students that have been then and are receiving other advanced learning opportunities, but how would the pathways specifically, those some of those programs that we're introducing, how would those intersect? So how would there be, say, a pathway and then an, an advancement on that pathway? Um, in the K-5 uh, pathways, what we are looking at is embedding those into the, the, the current school day. And so one of the first steps is, um, creating that foundation of advanced learning and support of exploration for uh, students in our primary and intermediate grades. We want to give them multiple opportunities. Um, one of the things that we are uh, working on with our advanced learning specialists is, is Dr. Golden has worked with the team. They are developing what we call pathways projects for uh, various grade levels, giving the students um, uh, the opportunity to explore more in depth into one of the four pathways and uh, creating a project based on inquiry and exploration, uh, hopefully to spark some of their interests so that they may want to explore further. Um, I think the important pieces to consider about pathways for kindergarten, first, second, and third grade for sure is that we want all the students to have those experiences. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, again, thank you for the presentation. Uh, we will now move uh, to the student representative report section of the information evening uh, with our student uh, representative, Milkame Adesu. Milkame? Sorry. <laughs> um, hello, board. Recently, Burnsville High School hosted an intimate prom for seniors only. Many people were pleased by the social distancing and effort put into the prom. Um, Many people were dancing all night, and after that, we were just very pleased with all of the um, intention put into it, considering COVID itself. Now, seniors are just looking forward to prom, I mean, sorry, not prom, <laughs> to graduation, and we're really hopeful for the future. Um, there's not much else for this evening but we're just very thankful for all that everyone did to put into prom and then um just thank you everyone that'll be it thank you Malcolm. and i i must uh, apologize i skipped right over item b in our agenda to receive an update on the uh, district 191's efforts to implement covid 19 uh, related educational and public health guidance issued by the MDE and the MDH. So, uh, Dr. Battle. Thank you, Chair Miller, directors of the board. Uh, tonight, Bernie Bean and I will share information related to health and safety 
and many uh, announcements about Governor Tim Walz's May 6th announcement about Minnesota's next steps to end COVID-19 restrictions and implications for uh, our District 191. First, we will begin with our health updates. Um, we received Dakota and Scott County information from Minnesota Department of Health for confirmed cases. And um, this time period is 418 to 51. Dakota County is at 49.07, representing a decrease from 54.69. Scott County is 50.78, representing a decrease from 58.24. As I mentioned in my opening on Wednesday, May 6, Governor Walz announced a three-step process that will lead to an end of all COVID-19 restrictions by May 28th and an end to the masking requirement by July 1st. The safe learning plan, including his executive orders, will continue to be in full effect for the remainder of the 2021 school year for all uh, public school districts in Minnesota. So this means we will continue to follow the safe learning plan until our last day of June 11th. There are three steps to um, Governor Walz's uh, plan to ease those restrictions. So on May 7th, the state began the initial steps to relax some restrictions, primarily in outdoor. On May 28th, the Friday before Memorial Day, all limits and restrictions will come to an end for indoor events and gatherings. However, two requirements will remain, face coverings indoors and for the largest outdoor events with controlled access. We do know there was an announcement by CDC today, so we'll see if we have a change in Minnesota based on that announcement. But also businesses will have plans that keep their employees safe as they have from the beginning of the pandemic. Step three, once 70% of Minnesotans age 16 plus get their vaccine, but no later than July 1st, the remaining face covering requirements um, will end. Later in the report, I will share updated information regarding the venue guidance that will impact our graduation ceremonies. A little bit more about some of the changes. Um, beginning May 7th, uh, masks were no longer required to be, were no longer required for outdoors. This includes recess. Um, however, they are still required indoors until the statewide requirement is lifted. Also for athletics, not required, mass face coverings are not required for student athletes, coaches, officials, or spectators in outdoor contests and practices. They do have some recommendation for athletes um, who are participants who are not actively participating. And so uh, the current Minnesota State High School League spring sports um, held indoors include badminton, adapted softball, and adapted bowling. Um, and so there's information that has been received by all of our coaches in our district. Um, I will now turn it over to Bernie Bean, who will provide more health and safety information. And then after she is finished, I will share some graduation ceremony news. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Um, good evening, Board of Directors and Chair Miller. So the 14-day rate for um, Dakota County and Scott County, they do predict that that number will go down again next week. So that's, that's good news. The positivity rate for Minnesota did decrease this week from 5.3 to 5.2. And Dakota County actually decreased from 6.9 to 6.1. Scott County went up a little bit from 6.1 to 6.7. The data for our district internally during the time frame of April 18th to May 1st, Health Services completed 16 case investigations for students or staff that were um, positive and infectious in our building during that time frame. The previous 14-day period, we had completed 17 investigations. Next week, this data point will return to 17. However, the week after that, we will see a significant drop where we will have a case investigation for six cases during the next time frame. This week, at, 
so far, we have had zero case investigations for positive individuals in our building. Um, Dakota County has seen similar statistics. Their seven day average for positive cases has been under 100 for the last three days. So the seven day average is 88, where last week it was 134. This is the lowest that they have seen since February 1st. However, the age groups that continue to have the highest rates are our 10 to 19 year olds and our 40 to 49 year olds. They did see one long-term case this week, um, positive case. And typically after we have a surge, we do see more hospitalizations and more death rate. And we're still seeing that in Dakota County. The hospital capacity remains tight. And this week they, um, they have nine deaths that occurred and last week there was 10 deaths. That is, should also serve as a reminder for us that we still need to continue to be COVID smart. As far as mitigation strategies in the school, we're continuing with the saliva screening um, for staff and that happens every other Monday. We just held that clinic this past Monday. Um, a couple of weeks ago, MDE in collaboration with Vault Health provided the opportunity for schools to extend the saliva screening program to our secondary students through either an in-school program or a take-home program. This past week, we launched for the secondary students a program where they could pick up a kit and take it home and return it when we do our staff screening. Currently, we have 110 participants in that program, and we will continue with that until the school year is over. So two more times we will be doing that. Vaccinations. Each week, um, Minnesota and Dakota County see an increase in the vaccination rate. Minnesota is at 61% for 16-year-olds and up, and Dakota County is at almost 65% for those 16-year-olds and up. This week, F the FDA and CDC approved the Pfizer vaccine for an emergency use authorization for our students that are 12 to 15. Dakota County plans to start offering that vaccination to students 12 to 15 at the Metcalf location next week. We will be sharing more information as that comes to us, um, but parents can go to the website for Dakota County and start to register for appointments. Um, for our, any student under 18 years of age, a parent or guardian does need to accompany the student and they may need to um, maybe ask to show a photo ID. Three weeks ago, MDH held the first pop-up clinic, a first dose pop-up clinic at our Burnsville High School for the students that are 16 years old and up. The second dose clinic is scheduled next week on the 17th and the 20th. Today, not too long ago, we learned of an opportunity that MDH will be extending this clinic to our 12 year old students and up. Um, and that will be, more information will come with that, but like Dakota County, a parent or a guardian will need a come to be with the student for their vaccination. Um, more links will be coming to register for appointments. As Dr. Battle said, CDC did announce today a new guidance for fully vaccinated individuals with the ability to shed their mask and social distancing and indoor activities. MDH with their due process and review is looking at that material and they will come up with a recommendation for Minnesota. My understanding is that can be as early as tomorrow. We will have recommendations towards mask indoors. The information I shared tonight and um, should give us all some hope that that past faint light that we were seeing in COVID darkness that we're coming to an end is now a beam that is shining strong. It is a reality that in the fall, we will have what is more normal to us to come back. Um, you know, Burnsville strong, we will end strong this year and, and keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie and some more light. With the May 28th lifting of restrictions by Governor Tim Walz, and thanks to the vigilance of students and staff over the past weeks, I'm announcing tonight 
that Burnsville High School will hold a traditional graduation ceremony for the class of 2021. All graduates will participate in a single ceremony so they can graduate with their friends and classmates. With that ceremony scheduled for 6 p.m. on Friday, June 11th at Pate Stadium. Additionally, there won't be restrictions on the number of people allowed to attend. However, in accordance with state guidelines, face masks will be required for all students, staff, and attendees. Students will be spread out on the field and social distancing will be encouraged as much as possible among attendees. The ceremony will be broadcast on Channel 18 and live streamed on YouTube for those who can't or prefer not to attend in person. If the weather does not permit an outdoor ceremony on Friday, June 11th, the ceremony will be moved to Saturday, June 12th. If Saturday weather prevents an outdoor ceremony, it will be moved indoors to the school gymnasium and attendance will be limited, which each graduate getting a number of tickets. Again, masks would be required social distancing encouraged, and the ceremony will be broadcast for those not in attendance. Burnsville Alternative High School is still planning for its graduation on June 10th at 5 p.m. outside of Boz. The rain date for their ceremony is 4 p.m. Friday, June 7th. Excuse me, uh, June 11th is the rain date. The best transition program graduation will be held June 8th, 6 p.m. at the Mirage Center. The district school for adults will produce a virtual honors night, which includes recognition of students who've earned their GEDs, among other accomplishments, on Friday, June 11th. I truly believe our students and our schools have done a tremendous job following health protocols to keep everyone as safe as possible during this pandemic. I want to stress that if we want to keep moving in the right direction, our community needs to remain vigilant, even as restrictions are relaxed and return to more normal activities. As Bernie shared, we still have, have hospitalizations, and so we still need to protect one another. Please get information about getting vaccinated and there's still time before the graduation ceremony. Dakota County Public Health and other organizations are holding clinics specifically for students and parents in the coming weeks, and it's never been easier to make an appointment. With all of that said, I'm looking forward to seeing our graduates. Their work and perseverance certainly deserves the celebration. Now looking ahead to fall, as Bernie mentioned, Minnesota Department of Education will continue to partner with Minnesota Department of Health to plan for next fall's openings of school. MDE Commissioner Heather Mueller sent a message to superintendents and charter school leaders. She shared she remains hopeful that we won't need to have a safe learning plan for the 2021-22 school year. MDE and MDH will continue to provide guidance and recommendations to school to ensure learning can safely continue. MDE will be providing more information in the coming weeks and over the summer, and in turn, our district will also put out more information about the fall. I'm very excited about the launch of our Virtual Academy in the fall and uh, seeing our students as we have now, K pre-K-5 in person, um, and we do have our hybrid, and so I'm very hopeful um, for next fall's opening. And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Uh, any questions or comments for Dr. Battle or Ms. Bean? As a friend of several seniors this year, <laughs> I am sure I can speak for them when I say thank you for the changes in the graduation. I think there will be many, many happy families in our community as a result of this change. And I'm grateful that we've been able to do all we've been able to do to get to this point where we're able to do this. So thank you to you and to all of your staff for making this possible. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair Miller. Um, just a couple questions, Dr. Battle. Uh, what was the guidance that the COVID Advisory Committee gave you on graduation? Uh, it varied, and so um, they were cautious as we still have COVID. Um, felt that uh, the students might want a reward for not going to the five days, but they felt that parents may have different reasons from the students about which option to continue with the two separate or with uh, the one graduation. And so they were very cautious but also felt that the students, uh, we didn't go back to five days in person. They stayed in hybrid and that it might be a reward for them to be together as one. So the committee's position was that it's better to reward the, the students um, than exercise caution. No, I wouldn't say there was consensus. Okay. Um, so it's interesting. We have parents and so... We had, they had to put on multiple hats. And so that's where we heard parents may want to have everybody there when it came to guests because it's such a special time and students may want to be with their friends. But we're all very cautious because COVID's still here. And a traditional graduation, um, just, you know, kind of running through typically what I, what I remember at our graduations that, you know, obviously the, the grads are on the field, the board is sitting on the dais and handing out diplomas, um, families and student congregate on the, on the football field. Um, families will be able to see their student walk across the stage on the video, the live videotron on the, on the scoreboard. Is that all that, oh, all that will be, will be oh, happening? Let me ask uh, Assistant Superintendent Brian Gersich. He can, he's been working with the admin. So we have made some uh, for social distancing for the graduates. So there will be social distancing for the graduates. And we are going to encourage uh, participants to also social distance. But uh, Assistant Superintendent Brian Gersich can give you some more details about a couple of other things you did ask about. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to this on. You might have this to mic push thing. It. Oh, yep. Uh, just a few things to add to that. So, traditional high school graduation, the sense of one ceremony and the guests being able to be there, but we are still discussing that there will be some additional parameters and mitigation. So, graduates on the field, we're going to work really hard to spread the graduates out. They might not be a full six feet, depending on how we're able to put those 550 chairs out there but we're talking about three to four feet of spacing between our graduates. And again, we're talking about, uh, although it might still be in question because of Governor Walls coming and, and suggesting that the mask mandate ends tomorrow, we have to digest information as it comes in on the fly, correct? So that just came out within the last 15 minutes, I think. So, uh, so but the current guidance was still wearing masks uh, in our graduation ceremony because certainly it would be a, a crowd of more than, than 500. So. There are still some mitigation logistics we have to work through, particularly, again, with our graduates. Uh, you also talked about congregating. Uh, that was one of the discussion points I had with uh, Principal Helke this morning, is finding ways to disrupt that, or not disrupt that, excuse me, discourage that because of the congregating and how that creates that additional potential crossing uh, of those who haven't been vaccinated to this point. So there will be some additional pieces to it that will be forthcoming. Um, but that's the, the, the context of the traditional graduation. And the dais for those on the dais, Whoops. such as me and board members? Correct. Additional things to be rolled out. So I would not say traditional. For example, how are we going to distribute diplomas will probably look a little different than the traditional graduation. So there's still pieces of that to be built out. I know the big newsworthy thing that I'm sure families and graduates are going to latch on to right now is, everyone's going to be able to be there together for one single ceremony. Thank you, Brian. And the video? Um, at this time, the scoreboard is not functioning, and so we're looking at an alternative, but there will be a video of them walking. Is that what you're asking? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. The scoreboard isn't working? No. Oh. Okay. Um, I guess, you know, of course, this is you and your team's call, um, Dr. Battle. I, I agree with you. Our graduates 
um, deserve celebration. I also believe given the data that we just heard in your report and the positivity rates, um, and given all the caution that we've exercised this, this year, um, first and foremost with our, um, the rich diversity that lives in our schools and protecting families who are harder, hit harder by um, illness, I think they also deserve thoughtful protection, but um, you know, I'm sure that your shoulders are, are broad enough to, to handle whatever repercussions might, might happen as a result of this, this large event. Yes. Any other uh, questions, comments? Just curious where the, how the school board takes part in the graduation. Do we just sit in the front rows or? Is there any other participation? Yeah, so tradi there's obviously a, a very large difference from tradition and what we would have done and, and what may happen this time around. Traditionally, we are all on the dais um, and we take turns handing out diplomas. Um, now that's what uh, Brian was just commenting on. That I think there's, there's still some thought and consideration going into how that'll be handled uh, for this event. So we'll get there, we'll figure it out. So. Okay. Um, Okay, with no other comments, uh, I would, you know, Dr. Battle, I am part of that advisory committee that meets on Fridays. Um, I would not necessarily agree with the assessment that we were mixed about it. We actually were pretty adamant that we felt uh, that we should stick to the two uh, events um, and opening it up full to everybody is concerning. But um, as uh, Director Alt in, uh, indicated, this is your decision to make. Um, I, you know, I, we put a lot of emphasis on the safety being that everybody's going to wear masks. I don't have any idea how we're going to enforce that. Um, and if we have 200 some parents show up and they choose not to wear masks, we will have no recourse to, to, to have any uh, say on that essentially. So, um, but again, it is your decision and we will move forward with that. Um, I have a question for uh, Ms. Bean. Um, as we now are seeing uh, middle schoolers down are, are getting vaccinated and such, refresh my memory on how that uh, plays into, let's say they're, uh, they're determined to be in close contact in a classroom or such, uh, or a bus ride or a sporting event or something of that nature. Does it shorten, if they're vaccinated, does it provide them a short time or some? Yep. Go ahead. The, the guidance for a fully vaccinated individual, whether it's a student or an adult, if you are fully vaccinated, meaning you've had your two doses and you're two weeks post that second dose, if you are classified as a close contact to a classmate, a workmate, a family member, you would not need to enter into quarantine unless you have symptoms. So that will significantly decrease the quarantine time for um, families. When, when their children are vaccinated or as themselves are vaccinated. Or for instance, the student is exposed and wants to attend graduation or go to that baseball tournament if they've been vaccinated, it's going to uh, in, in ensure that that happens or makes it easier for them to get there. Correct, correct. Excellent. Okay, uh, we will now uh, come back to Dr. Battle for your superintendent report. Thank you. Chair Miller, directors of the board. Um, I have some exciting news to share tonight and something that makes uh, me so proud and I think it shows the character of our students and this community. This week we learned that 70 students from Burnsville High School will be recognized by interview as national award winners for their community service. Each of them has given more than 20 hours of service with seven of those students giving more than 100 hours of service. These awards are presented by Interview, an organization and online platform that helps students, groups, and schools highlight the impact of community service and connects their efforts to the United Nations global goals. These students are truly inspirations. Even in the midst of a global pandemic, they have continued their commitment to serving their community. Beyond these award winners in the last year, nearly 200 Burnsville High School students have donated almost 10,000 combined hours of service. So I want to thank them for giving of their time and their gifts with others. And I also want to thank Youth Services Court Coordinator Courtney Jackson Flobeck, Flobeck, who helps organize, encourage, and inspires our wonderful students. And that concludes my report for tonight. Awesome, thank you.
Uh, next section under uh, information will be for board member reports. Uh, just reminding you that these are not your committee assignments, but uh, all the other um, things you might want to bring to the attention of the public and our services board members. So I'll open it up for anybody that wants to go. Go ahead, Dr. Director Hume. All right, I have a report. I attended my first uh, Burnsville High School Hall of Fame committee meeting um, on Wednesday, April the 28th. It was actually the committee's first meeting since March of 2020. So I guess I didn't miss anything. Um, obviously the work of the committee has been on hold for the last year due to COVID. So um, one of the things that I think that I remember Director Courier bringing up and it came up again at this meeting last week or two weeks ago now is that the current Hall of Fame bylaws require a board member to be on the committee and they are going to be changing that to say that a board member may be on the committee. Um, and Director Courier was actually at that meeting. So it was good to see her. I hadn't seen her in a long time. Um, obviously there was no Hall of Fame um, selection last year due to COVID. Um, they were just, they had all the applications in and were preparing to make the selections when everything shut down. So they're looking at having an expanded class for 2021. And in fact, the review of the nominees will happen at the next meeting on May the 19th, which is next week already. Um, the timing of the ceremony, the induction ceremony is to be determined, could be later this fall or in early 2022, depending on where we are at that point with COVID restrictions and such. Um, and that concludes my report. Any other board member reports this evening? No? Okay. We will then leave the information section of our meeting and move into the business meeting section, um, beginning with our consent agenda. Although board action is required, it is generally unnecessary to hold discussion on these items. In the event a board member wishes to discuss an item, that item will be moved for separate consideration. So I'll ask at this time if there's anything on the consent agenda that a board member wishes to move out for separate consideration. Seeing none, um, Ms. Kenny, will you please, oh, excuse me, first, I need a motion. Um, so I will take a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Moved by Director Alt. Second. Seconded by Director Werb. Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Hunter. Aye. Chester. Aye. Miller. Aye. Alt. Aye. Werb. Aye. Hume. Aye. All right, and with that, the consent agenda passes unanimously. Tonight, uh, then, we will move to our new business where we have just one item tonight, and that is the, to approve the joint powers agreement with the West Metro School Districts for network collaboration. Uh, the speaker bringing tonight's uh, action item forward is Rachel Gordon, Director of Technology. Rachel? Good evening, Chair Miller, board members, and Superintendent Battle. Tonight I'm here with a recommendation for ISD 191 to join the West Metro School Districts for Network Collaboration or Collaborative Joint Powers Agreement. In April, I short, shared information on the options for us to ensure we receive Minnesota Telecommunications and Internet um, Access Equity Program reimbursement aid. Our existing qualification will end after our contract with Sourcewell expires on June 30th of this year. In April, you asked for our legal counsel to review the JPA and provide feedback. Our counsel noted four items in their review. First, they clarified that members are allowed to withdraw by providing 60 days written notice. Withdrawing members remain obligated to meet all responsibilities through the end of the term. The review of the language regarding the end of the term indicates a period of five years. The second point identified was regarding the cost sharing provisions and clarification around whether a member district could be held responsible for its portion of an expenditure that it does not consent to. The analysis from legal counsel was that it seems to suggest that a member district cannot be held responsible for cost sharing unless the terms are quote, mutually agreed upon, um, end quote. The third item noted was a strong des a desire for a stronger hold, uh, hold harmless language. However, they identified Minnesota statute that it would ensure the district would not be held liable for acts or omissions unless agreed upon in writing. Finally, they suggested we review any additional bylaws and addendum, uh, agenda, addendum to the JPA. Through communication with the JPA members, we confirmed that no additional bylaws or addenda exist. 
Participating in the West Metro JPA will provide approximately $21,000 of reimbursement for internet services per year. The cost to ISD 191 to participate will be approximately $150 for filing the paperwork. Based on our legal review and the financial benefit to the district, our recommendation is that the board approve the joint power agreement with the West Metro School Districts for network collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. May I have a motion for the uh, recommendation in front of us? So moved. Moved by Director Hume. May I have a second? Second. Seconded by Director Chester. I will open it up for discussion or questions on the, act, the motion in front of us. Any questions? No? All right, seeing none. I, I will ask Ms. Kenny to call the roll. Chester? Aye. Miller? Aye. Alt? Aye. Werb? Aye. Hume? Aye. Connor? Aye. And the motion in front of us passes unanimously. Uh, at this point, that ends our new business a portion of our meeting and I am going to call our regular scheduled meeting to an adjournment uh, with an adjourn we will be adjourning to a workshop. I am going to suggest that we take say 10 minutes since we're running pretty quick on schedule this evening uh, to stretch our legs for a few minutes. So it is, the time I have is 725 at 735 we will pick up the meeting with our workshop.
Okay, since we are back, we will, um, as I mentioned earlier, now move to a workshop component of our evening. Uh, beginning with uh, a considering reinstatement of elementary activity programs, activities programs for fall of 2021. Uh, bringing this forward for discussion will be Brian Gersich, Assistant Superintendent. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Miller, uh, Board of Directors, and Superintendent Battle for this opportunity to uh, bring this proposal forward as a part of this work session this evening. Uh, I'm pleased tonight to be joined by Brad Robb, who is one of our elementary principals in just one, District 191 at Ron Elementary. And uh, Amina Oftedal, Oftedal will be joining us again, our Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Assessment, who obviously was a part of our uh, meeting earlier in the agenda. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. I will start just with a very brief purpose for this, uh, this session tonight, as well as a little bit of the financial history of uh, where we've been with these elementary proposals. And then I will bring uh, Principal Rob and uh, Director Oftedal to talk a little bit more about the substance of the proposal, as, as well as to what we see as the uh, sustainable funding source for these activities that are proposed. And then I'll return with some comments about our next steps, taking hopefully some suggestion and guidance from the board on that. Uh, next slide, thank you. So it was a couple of months ago that Principal Rob and uh, a couple of his colleagues uh, approached me on behalf of the elementary principals about what it would take or the possibilities of putting back in some of the outside of, of class time uh, enrichment activities for our students uh, as something that would you know, engage them in, again, enrichment and extension activities as well as leadership opportunities. Uh, what you see this evening is the kind of the culmination of, of some of those efforts over the last couple of months, again, on behalf of that team. And I think as I think you will see and hopefully hear over the course of this evening, uh, this is a sincere commitment from our elementary principals, all of them, uh, to be a part of advocating for these activities and certainly their commitment to ensuring that this is a consistent and equitable offering for the students in our district. Uh, and certainly we hope you see a little bit as to the why, as to why this is coming forward and the feasibility uh, of doing so. Next slide, please, Aaron. Uh, in looking at a little bit of the history uh, and looking back at some of the budget decisions that were, were recommended and made, you'll notice that it was in the fiscal year of 19 that stipends for tech club, student council and choir uh, were eliminated. Again, these were a part of general fund reductions. And so when you see fiscal year 19, recall that those would be decisions that would have been made by uh, school board in the spring of 2018, the previous spring for the subsequent fiscal year. Um, I believe that it is likely, I'm sorry, uh, in fiscal year 20, uh, eliminated science fair, uh, peer support and volunteer support, and you'll see kind of the, uh, uh, the savings that were included as a part of the board packet as a part of those decision-making practices. I think what you know, is likely to have happened is administration made these recommendations based on the best information that they had at the time. Um, I think that when we look at this, Principal Rob would be able to give some firsthand experiences as to how the intent was certainly to take some of those um, offerings and opportunities and bring those in as a part of the school day. But again, Principal Rob would be able to help explain how what ended up was that something that wasn't as robust as it once was, and perhaps not as consistent as it once was when you look at that across all of our sites. Uh, before I turn it over to Principal Rob, the one other thing I'd like to point out on this slide, if you're doing the math and you, you match that up with the math later, I want you to realize when you see that line item for the example of fiscal year 19, that included stipends for tech club, student council, and choir. Not all of those are being proposed as a part of this to bring back. So you'll notice that those numbers in there are a larger sum. And I will also point out that would have represented 10 elementary schools compared to the current eight elementary schools that we have right now. So again, for those who are maybe nerdy like me and like to balance numbers later on, that's why there's gonna be a little bit of a disconnect in this slide and the subsequent slide that has our uh, estimates and proposal. I'd uh, now like to, uh, next slide there, please, Aaron. I'd like to welcome Principal Brad Robb. Um, thank you, thank you, Brian. Um, Chair Miller, uh, board members, uh, Superintendent Battle, thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit about this, uh, what we would consider to be something really wonderful for our students at the elementary level. And by reinstating these programs, we um, 
we have the, we have the chance to, as Brian was saying, uh, have a robust uh, opportunities for students to go above and beyond the curriculum. And when we see that, uh, we see the possibility of, of having more project-based learning, uh, connecting students with the school at a greater level, um, and then thinking about pathways and the career exploration activities that um, that students could possibly explore when they're uh, involved in these. Um, and then those leadership skills that comes in the form of like student council and peer leaders. And then this is a chance for our students to just take an active role uh, in, in their school and get connected with their school. And so we're very excited about um, the chance to share more about uh, what these could look like in the future. I'll pass it on over to uh, Amina to share a little bit more about the pathways. So earlier, um, Chair Miller asked me the question about how do we see the advanced learning um, align with the pathways and incorporated within that. This is one of the examples of opportunities that students would have to really push uh, their exploration into some of the pathways. When you look at the proposal and you see which of the pathways that are being, uh, could we have a slide? Um, that to see the um, opportunities that students might have in these, again, it goes back to that core belief that a pathway school use, uh, operates with equity and access and opportunities for rigor. And having these co-curricular activities fits very directly into the themes and topics of the four pathways. And um, just an opportunity, um, as we talked about pathway schools, we talked about um, uh, last year, we really wanted to look at, are there some programs or services that had been eliminated that we could financially and sustainably reinstate? And um, the uh, extracurriculars, the co-curricular for activities for our elementary students is, uh, is an excellent opportunity uh, and segue into uh, the pathways. Um, next slide, please. As Assistant Superintendent um, Gersich mentioned earlier, is that uh, all eight of the elementary principals got together and uh, and really expressed the desire to re uh, reexamine these uh, these programs for our students. And so we came together and then we presented um, this proposal, this idea of how might we be able to get these back in. Um, and what was really uh, amazing is that there was such a strong commitment from the principals to ensuring that our students had these opportunities and realizing that over the past few years, it just hasn't come to fruition or it's been inconsistent from building to building, from teacher to teacher. And, um, and this has presented an opportunity for us to start fresh, um, come to some calibration of how we can ensure that all of our students have equal access and equal opportunity across all eight elementary schools for these opportunities. So let me just share a little bit about um, the four that we're um, asking for your consideration. Uh, the first one is Technology Club. And as has been in the past, it's really to extend the, the learning that already happens in digital learning specialist class um, to go above, above and beyond. Um, some, some tech clubs might focus on um, expanding their, um, their understanding of coding or video production. Um, whatever the, the group might uh, move forward with, but, but this is where students can really um, go above and beyond what they are learning uh, in the regular curriculum. Um, and of course, with that, um, the students are, are working on problem solving skills and critical thinking and, um, and just really being creative um, with use of technology. And obviously in our day and age right now, we understand uh, the need to, to go above and beyond with technology. And, uh, in addition, the uh, another opportunity for students would be with student council, and this is this has been the organization within the school that provides leadership uh, for for the school that that focuses on school spirit and connecting kids with their community and really getting behind uh, their particular school and ISD 191. And so, uh, what's what's amazing about this group and has been in the past is that students are taking ownership and that they are they are moving to the forefront and and they're making the decisions for the school with the guidance of the um, 
uh, the, the staff members supporting them. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, Science Fair um, has been a, a critical component of, of most elementary school experience across the board. And in fifth grade, uh, part of the curriculum is the scientific method and understanding that. And when we have a science fair with, with kind of the, the trifold posters and the, um, the high school students coming in and, and, um, and looking over the science fair projects and our community members coming in and then a display. And you all know this, you've experienced this or seen this where families are coming in and checking out the student work. That is, uh, that's one of those events in that are those memories in elementary school that uh, we want to ensure our students have and really have a chance for students not only to learn the scientific method, but to take that above and beyond and really grow a passion um, for what it is that they're doing and inspire some students uh, to possibly move that into their careers. We talk about pathways. And so uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is inconsistencies when we have when we have staff members that are passionate about this and have volunteered their their time and effort, um, there's some great things happening. Yet, when we rely on volunteers, there creates that inconsistency of experience for our students. And it's our desire as principals to create a consistent experience across the board for all of our students um, to have this, um, this amazing experience like science fair. Mm -hmm. And then the final group that uh, uh, opportunity for our students would be peer leaders. And again, connecting with our community, it's so important uh, that uh, our students are not only working to develop a, a strong community within the school, but then to go beyond the walls and connect with the greater community. And that's done through volunteerism, service projects, and even taking time to, um, to beautify the, the, the school per se. Uh, again, like student council, this is where students are taking the lead. They're coming up with the ideas. They are they're the ones that are invested in making the community better. Um, with the support of staff members to really guide them through that process. And we're just, we want that for our kids. We, um, uh, since the, the past three years that these, these opportunities have not existed in a consistent manner, our kids are not feeling as connected. They're not as, um, uh, as involved as we, we know that they want to be. And this allows us to really focus on that and, um, and, yeah, have that consistent opportunity across the board. So those are the four uh, opportunities that we're proposing. I'll pass it over to, to Director Aftadal. A key component to offering the opportunities and developing that consistency oh. is the sustainability. Um, the Title IV funding on well-rounded education is uh, designed to provide those enrichment activities. And so a portion of those dollars uh, have been used for short-term projects, such as uh, funding some of the work with the advanced learning specialist as we get that work uh, off the ground. Um, it's also been used for other short-term projects such as the grade five instrumental music project. Um, and we'd like to see some of those funds uh, Pour directly into our pathway support. When you think about the, the tech club, you're looking at uh, supporting the, the technology pathways, engineering, IT. When you look at the uh, leadership pathway, you're really looking at supporting our entrepre entrepreneurship and um, leadership. Uh, you, each of the pathways can be represented in these opportunities, and we believe that we can sustain that uh, year after year after year by dedicating these funds to support them. And the next slide there. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so for just from a next steps perspective, uh, certainly depending on the, the conversation and, and the direction of uh, the board or the officers as to setting the agenda, we'd be proposing to bring this proposal back for board action at the, the May 27th meeting. Um, as Brad had talked uh, during his comments, a, a theme of, of our principles has been consistency and that commitment to what they called calibrating and norming, uh, what the expectations for these activities would be across all of our sites. 
Um, and so they are committed to, if, if approved to do that, to make sure that they have that completed before they start you know, advertising, promoting, and selecting advisors so that there's a clear understanding of the expectations and what we would be taking on. Uh, uh, again, that commitment to offering these equitable opportunities across all of our sites. Um, and then, uh, as uh, Amina Oftedal had talked about, you know, there has been that identified uh, non-general fund source, uh, but two caveats that I think are in the proposal. Um, those numbers do not take into account TRA and FICA, so there may be a small, very modest need for general fund support for that if we were able to run all four activities at all eight sites in a single year. So again, that's 32. I, I do believe that when you look at that, the commitment is to work to offer all of them, but there may be years because we do have a finite number of students that if kids one year get really excited about one opportunity and it doesn't offer enough at the other opportunity to run that, it is theoretically possible that we need to have one of those activities not run, but the commitment would be to find a way to make them all run and certainly not have that happen in back-to-back -back years. The other piece is still, again, in the proposal. Unclear is what that would look like for Virtual Academy. Uh, it would end up being a modest uh, number of students, so they may not have a population density to run all of those, so it's a matter of working with that team to see how can we engage Virtual Academy students in some of these opportunities as well, whether that's capturing on uh, virtual participation or simply offering, uh, you know, some opportunity to say what would maximize participation from some of our students. But pending all of that, that's when we would be looking for that implementation right away in the fall. That concludes our presentation. Uh, I thank everyone and I will turn it to Mr. Chair for next steps. Thank you. Um, I will open it up for questions and comments. This is a workshop, so hopefully we have some discussion around the topic at hand. Since my children have been out of school about five years now, I'm wondering, do they have the science fair? I assume they have the science fair still in junior high also, right? And high school? I'm not sure about the high school. Amina, do you know? Uh, middle school, I have been to the, uh, the science fair, so I can speak to that, that they do have it. Mm -hmm. I do not look know what is the, the high school. They do. Um, and then one note on the middle school is just to recognize that not all students have the opportunity to participate in the science fair in the middle school and um, moving forward with the embedded honors, we'll be able to offer that even more broadly. Okay, because that was my concern when I was working in the school system. I found um, for students of color, a lot of times they didn't have um, as much support as they needed, especially in when, since you mentioned elementary school. Um, and so they got very frustrated when other kids were able to take part in that and they were not. So it was kind of really detrimental and kind of emotional for them. So that is one program um, I think should be for the older kids or maybe just the junior high kids because they can work together and maybe have more, have one parent help that's able to as opposed to the grade school children that have a lot of times have parents that um, both work or they don't have that, the parents don't have time to participate in that and the children get very emotionally um, just upset that they can't participate because they can't do it on their own. Yeah, and I think that's an important point to recognize is that uh, students uh, who would participate in this as a co-curricular would have that advisor to support them all the way through the process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so Director Ward. Um, so the cost, is this uh, implementation cost only? No, that would be a year-over-year -year cost. Okay. The, the, the request is for the stipends on an annual basis. Okay. And so these are strictly like after-school type programs, correct? Uh, in, uh, that is not correct. Thank no? you for asking that question. Um, Principal Rob, I'm not sure if you want to expand on this a little bit. I'll give you a second if uh, I'm catching you off guard. Uh, but there is a mix of participation and opportunities in the school day. In fact, a lot of this occurs during the school day. And that is a part of maximizing access that students have to these opportunities. There may be some things, a student council, for example, they may meet frequently during the school day, but there may be opportunities in the evening, like if student council is gonna come and do something to support conferences or an open house that would happen outside of the school day. Um, Brad, is there anything you'd wanna to add to yep. that? Yeah, definitely, I could expand on that. And 
Um, and that's part of when the elementary principals got together uh, to ensure like, how are we going to make, make this uh, equitable across the, across the buildings and to ensure that as many students um, can participate without any barriers. So, uh, you know, we, we brainstormed and we, we call on our, our past experiences where we have had students um, or, or clubs meet during the day as, um, as was just shared. Um, and, you know, one particular example above the, um, the student council one that was just shared is, would be science fair. Uh, a lot of the work is gonna be done uh, in the classroom and provided, and then the, the leadership from the student council advisor, I'm sorry, from the science fair advisor would guide and direct the whole, the whole process, the, the experience that is, um, that's with the, with the trifold boards, the uh, evening program where families are coming in and, and checking out the work. And then also the, the, uh, the connection to Mankato because uh, winners from uh, the science fair uh, project then can move on to uh, Mankato and compete against uh, other projects across the uh, across the state, and so this would allow for that. Uh, but yeah, so the experiences are during the day, but then as occasionally there might be some evening um, evening events. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, that's good to know. And also, um, Principal Rob, I don't know if you remember, I got to, the chance to meet you at the Sioux Trail PTO meeting when they were closing schools. I was there representing William Byrne, but I just remember us talking about the great um, clubs that they had at Ron and coding was one of them and mm -hmm. wishing that we'd had that at William Byrne. So I really appreciate that you are thinking about this equitably for having a, it across all, this, all the elementary schools. And I appreciate the, the work that you've done on this with um, the other principals for the elementary schools. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. Um, we know this is good for kids. Mm -hmm. I, yes. So um, I'll start by saying not all cuts are created equal. And um, I had, Brian, you can attest to the number of questions that I had leading up to this workshop. And having reflected on them, I realized um, that it just reminded me how painful it was at the time to make this cut because it wasn't cutting stuff. It wasn't cutting equipment. It was cutting direct access for our students to some really incredible opportunities. And I think that's why, you know, I did have the questions that I did because the last thing I want is for us to bring this back only to find out, you know, two, three years down the road, it's coming back and nope, sorry, we can't, we can't make it run. So um, understanding that there is calibration that the principals are working together on this to make sure that um, that access is equitable and you know every effort will be made um, to have these four opportunities at each of our schools is is very reassuring to me because um, again I really don't I don't want to face that again I really don't um, one couple of questions that I that I did have that came to mind as you were talking. In your plans, have you discussed a transition to middle school for the students that are participating in these opportunities and kind of keeping them connected at middle school um, before they get there? So from a from like a formalized mapping perspective, there, there hasn't been that level of detail. Certainly I've had conversations with our middle level principals about what's being asked, you know, kind of cross-referencing a bit as to what they have for their activities and I've got it in an email here as well. I think there's a number of these opportunities that lend well into other opportunities at the middle level, but not necessarily from the concerted effort. I think what we'll continue to do is the principals calibrate as we take a look at the opportunities that are being provided, making sure that there's that communication. If for some reason we've had an opportunity at a site that wasn't offered, and that happens to be a group of fifth graders coming in, what are we doing to make sure that we're, you know, encouraging that opportunity, paying attention to the discrepancies for kids who may come in, et cetera. But again, so far, it has not been formalized, just you know, conversation so that there's an awareness. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I imagine the calibration really is gonna be a regular check-in um, in some form as far as, okay, how are we doing? Is it, you know, is, is this 
performing the way we would hope? Are we getting the numbers that we want? If we're not, um, what, what else can we do differently? Yep. No, really good question. I, I think, you know, as, as we kind of heard through the process, uh, Brad, he helps lead some, some of the meetings and the co uh, conversations with the elementary principal team. I see him leading the front end of the, of the calibration that we talked about before we kind of hire those advisors. Uh, but the team is also committed, and I believe there's also language in the pro proposal that talks about monitoring that. And uh, the, the team realizes we're going to develop a tracking form for all of us to see, you know, how many opportunities do we have, the number of students participating, are the students participating representative of the populations that we serve? Because all of those are going to be used to both calibrate and recalibrate to make sure that the, the outcome matches the intent of these opportunities for kids. And so the, the team is committed. I think they realize that. That's a, that's a part of what you know, still needs to be built out. But conceptually, we've already talked about having that tracking spreadsheet. Great. Thank you. Additional Would your plans please? ever include field trips if it were, if it were financially doable as opposed to maybe not the science fair i'm just yep. wondering if you talked and discussed that at all i have not i did not have conversations related to field trips in this particular proposal i don't know if brad has any pieces certainly it's, it's interesting because field trips are one of those things that we just haven't talked about for mm -hmm. 18 months right so it's almost like huh i haven't heard the field trip <laughs> word in a long time <laughs> Well, one thing, one thing to add is that as we reinstate these programs, or if we have the opportunity to reinstate these programs, the school is committed to, to providing a budget that, to help with this, to, uh, to make it a great experience. So, and that would come at, at each site, that we would be setting aside money. So, for instance, if student council is wanting to do like a, a school spirit type activity, um, or if the, the peer leaders are, uh, are going out into the community uh, doing some service projects that we'd be able to provide um, busing for that uh, or whatever whatever the cost might be to, to support this because uh, we know that additional funds are going to help out and that would be on the that would be on the school budget um, to do that and so um, or that that would be kind of an initial thought regarding that um, any school is going to have have slightly different takes on how they're going to implement that but part of the calibration and the monitoring will be the discussions among the principals to say okay what are you doing that's really successful and what what opportunity do you have uh, for kids and you know how'd you get that uh, to take place and along with the elementary principal conversations as assistant superintendent Gersich was saying uh, connecting with the middle school because they have similar programs and they're doing some great things as well so how do we how do we build that bridge between middle school and elementary school um, in relation to budgets and field trips and things of that nature? Dr. Yeah. Um, so coming in, the, the presentation answered most of my questions. The because I was more concerned about you know equity within all eight schools and how is this going to be sustainable? Because like our my fellow board members, we hate to have to cut anything out of budgets, knowing we're facing budget cuts often. Um, and my concern was if we were to start something only to have to cut it next year, that's not something I would want to move forward with. But I'm glad to see that there's some sustainability built in in terms of the Title IV funding. Are we seeing that as something we can count on year after year after year to sustain? And then hearing, too, that with some of the activities or projects would, is, I'm like, that's just the stipend. There might need to be other program expenses for like supplies and things and so where is that funding coming from and then would that be reflected in a general fund or something that would be up for cutting or you know how do we sustain yep. the additional needs and hearing that they would be in the school's budget would each school be allocating the same funds to be able to do the activity so there's equity within the budgeting between school to school to school <clears throat> So what I'll do is I'll kind of take that last part of that question and then I'll invite uh, Director Oftedal to talk about the stipends component and the Title IV uh, sustainability. Um, you're, you're correct in that the, um, I was about to call him Professor Rob and I'm not sure. <laughs> Principal Rob uh, just talked about that we, we are asking in this proposal for the stipends, but as he said, the principals are prioritizing this and are willing to set aside their building allocations. All of our principals, and all of our sites have a certain amount, it is a finite amount, of course, of resources available um, to, to put towards the supplies and the materials that are needed. So there are some 
prioritizing of their use of funds for these activities. And again, to me, that just speaks to the, the, the fact that our principals are looking for kind of a funding partner in this thing, not asking for the whole thing, realizing they're gonna have to prioritize and make some sacrifices as well. I don't see normalizing the funding. Again, I think as, as Principal Rob talks, we wanna normalize the experience. We wanna calibrate what students have access to. And part of that, it, it, it might be that somebody has a creative way to use materials that are different. We want the experiences to be normal, but they may have different ways to make sure that those resources uh, are coming from other ways or from uh, donations from PTOs or, or others who just drop by. You know, as a, as a high school principal, somebody stopped in and said, I've got a giant, you know, thing of, of paper and do you want that? You, you take the donation of paper kind of a thing. So again, it's the experience and the calibration to make sure everybody has what they need and that that experience is equitable. It might not necessarily be that, you know, dollars per dollar is gonna be utilized the same, but principals are gonna be using their site allocations to support some of the resources. Director Othadal, do you wanna talk about the sustainability of Title IV? Sure, uh, the Title IV is a reinstatement through the um, Every School Succeeds Act. And it's, uh, it is a, an ongoing entitlement based on our um, free and reduced lunch uh, formula, as well as our Title I's and Title II. So all of our title programs are, are and this one uh, will never be a large amount of dollars, but it will always be a, a, a good, solid, uh, predictable amount. I certainly. I'm sorry, certainly we don't want to bring something back that's going to be removed later anyways. Obviously, that is a painful process and it's just very difficult to do that. I think that's what sets this apart in our mind right now and why we feel comfortable. There are other things we would love to go out and search and bring back into our system because we know it's good for students. But we need an idea that turns into a plan with a sustainable funding source. We believe that's what we have here. We'd love to go out and look for that in other locations, but we can't make those guarantees other than we're committed to continuing to utilize resources in as efficient a way as we can and see if some of those opportunities that were painful reductions in the past can come back. It's, it's a commitment to a process, not a commitment to any particular activity or location or otherwise. I wanted to dovetail a, a follow-up question on, on Leslie's um, remarks. And I'm not necessarily looking for an answer tonight, so feel free to think about it and you know get back to us. Have you discussed what might happen um, in light of the fact that not all PTOs are created equal? Yeah. In terms of fundraising? Uh, say more, is in? In terms of, you had talked about, you know, PTOs assisting with the funding of programs like this. Yep. No, I think that's what I mean when I say calibrate what do they have access to, so that way if I get it from my site allocations or I get it from a donation, it's not like one group stands out above the others because they have this more robust experience because that's a site that has more money. And, I, it, and if I'm wrong, I'd like Principal Rob to correct me tonight so I'm not making statements that aren't accurate, but I see that as part of the calibration process. Okay. We don't have gold-plated science boards over here and you know napkins on, on the other side. We all have similar access to the materials needed. To me, that's the firm tight. Where did those materials come from? Some vari variation can be there. Awesome, thank right. you. One thing I noticed on the presentation, and you kind of alluded to this when you mentioned there may be some years where programs may not run at a given school if there's not enough student interest. But on the, I think it was the history slide, there was mentioned that in pr pr recent years, a number of the stipends had gone unfilled. So my question is, what, what are your initial thoughts if there is interest at a school but we're unable to find anyone to take on the stipend? Yep, great question. And I'm gonna bring Principal Rab in there to talk about how he's gonna motivate and inspire people to do that. <laughs> and I think that's a legitimate, that's a legitimate concern that, that um, existed. And that created the inconsistencies across the board of, of finding those individuals. But, we as principals, so this is the way I see it, is, is that we as principals um, are committed to ensuring our kids get these opportunities. Therefore, we're committed to reaching out to our staff and motivating our staff to fill these spots, to give these opportunities for kids, because we recognize this has been missing. Our, our kids need to be um, much more connected with school. And in the same light, as we, as we are hiring these positions, so we, we have the level kind of 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 evaluation and of 
the implementation of, of these programs for our students, we're going to ask that our advisors also have those expectations that students are being involved. So they're motivating the students um, to get involved and connected with the groups. And so um, it's kind of like we have accountability um, with, with our community, with our school, that our kids are going to get this at every school. And then there's accountability with our advisors that the kids are actually showing up and participating in those regular meetings. And there's, there's experiences that kids are having um, above and beyond uh, what they would currently have during the school day. So, I mean, that's a lot to say. Um, we're motivated. We've, um, we're, we're super excited about doing this. And uh, we want that to translate into our work with staff to, to fill these spots. Is it a requirement that the people who are receiving the stipends be current staff members in the buildings? Um, it, it is not a requirement, um, at sure, least not according to the contract. And um, mm -hmm. Brian, you might correct me, or Amina, you might correct me as far as the, the, the language within the contract, or Stacy, if you're there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know in other, in other positions, stipend positions that exist uh, district-wide, they're not necessarily connected with the, uh, with the school. With that being said, it's really hard to motivate students to be involved right. when you're not with the students kind of on a regular basis in the school day, um, especially because some of these uh, or most of these are going to happen during the school day to get kids involved. So it just wouldn't make logical sense. But I think from a, a technical standpoint, it's not required. Thank you. Well, grades are always a motivator, too, to get kids involved in things like that. So are, will they be graded on some of these things like student? I don't know if there's a grade for student council, but maybe you could implement that. <laughs> I mean, that I, I know that works. <laughs> Just an idea. <laughs> Any other uh, comments, questions? Um, First of all, I'd like to make sure and uh, again, thank you guys for the presentation this evening. I'd also like to point something out here. Um, <clears throat> tonight, we had a presentation. Uh, I know we just had uh, Amina and uh, Brad uh, make the presentation, but behind it was, well, if I understand right, the eight principles from our... Um, so these principles weren't just getting together to talk about meeting their metrics or working on a plan for this or that or whatever. They came up with a creative idea, a need in our community, and brought it forward to the board. And I would like to acknowledge that, because that is the kind of leadership and thinking that we would like to encourage in this district. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I want to encourage this concept of calibration. I love hearing that. I think as sad as it is, the students that missed out on these opportunities the last couple of years, it's almost a benefit that we cleared the slate and coming back to these now because now we can put them in place with the way and the methodology that we would like to see as a district. It was, we had sort of ingrained behavior that was going on before that was so hard to undo. Not that we did this on purpose, but <laughs> it has a benefit of that. Um, and, you know, and I like the idea. If we have zero or low interest, super low interest, we, 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 we know we're in a spending uh, constrained environment, we may have not be able to run it that year. There are many opportunities that we have now available, uh, learned in the last few years, potentially a, a couple of students at one school want to do it and we can't justify the stipend there. Maybe they're virtually joining a group at another school. Maybe they're joining the virtual academy group that, that year. You know, So we do have opportunities that we'd never had before. And I would recognize when we talked about closing a couple of elementary schools, we talked about a lot of factors that went into that and we you know, we tried to put numbers on it. It was never very easy to do. Um, ironically, there's a, economies of scale here that we've talked briefly about but never really got to put a finger on it. So I'd like to put my finger on it now that that's another point that when we did downsize a little bit, it allows us to bring some things back that we had to cut. We did talk about that. I'm sure Dr. Alden can very clearly remember that. So any other comments or questions? This, uh, as imp implied, that uh, you all will kind of think about it and we'll come forward in our next regular scheduled meeting for a uh, vote on whether we approve it officially or not. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move to the next item on our workshop this evening, and that is the draft of, 
of a tre our strategic plan vision and core values. Uh, speaking on this topic will be Dr. Battle, Superintendent, and Aaron Tinkleberg, Director of Communications. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so tonight we're going to bring you uh, the draft vision and values and some updated information. Uh, when we began the review and revision of our strategic roadmap, we identified six guiding questions. And so tonight we are going to bring information um, as a result of uh, responses to two of the questions. First, where should our district be in the long run, the vision, and second, what should our district be now and in the near term? Um, and so I'll turn it over to our Director of Communications, Aaron Tinklenberg. Thank you, Dr. Battle, I'm Chair Miller, and members of the board. Uh, this is a, a little bit of an update kind of on the presentation that I gave at the last meeting about the process that we've been going through around vision and values. Um, uh, before, you, you do have in your packet um, an updated draft of the vision and values as well as a report from the, uh, from the thought exchange that we conducted uh, this spring with members of the public, staff, and students, and parents. Um, but before we get to that, I kind of want to uh, go through just a little bit of the background and the process that we got to get to here so that you're aware of where we're at and anybody who's watching online as well. Um, so we did do those that input in the fall, gathered input in the fall about um, uh, from everybody kind of around the community um, as to you know who we are as a district and uh, who we want to be, what are, what's important to the community. And from that, uh, developed this uh, first draft of new vision and values. Then we presented that at the uh, leadership team meeting, made some minor adjustments there as well, and then did another thought exchange to try to get input back from there. Um, as, that, as that thought exchange concluded, uh, what we found is that we needed to, and it's not terribly surprising, but we needed to make sure that we reached out to some target audiences, especially among staff, to hear, make sure we were hearing from all voices. Um, so I did conduct um, two, or participated in two meetings, uh, one with our cultural liaisons last week and then one with Amplify, um, our affinity group for staff members of color yesterday, and really appreciated hearing their input as well. Um, one of the things that I want to point out, uh, even before you look at the report, is that uh, although I'm going to focus on sort of what's different and what's changed and how we changed it based on the input that we got, overwhelmingly both in the fall and in the spring people are are generally happy with the mission of the district they don't want to see that changed they are uh, generally happy with the direction of the district in terms of uh, pathways being our sort of primary model they identify strongly with that um, we heard uh, a lot of strong support for our emphasis on cultural proficiency as well uh, among the things that we're doing so this isn't a matter of uh, sort of uh, a, a complete teardown and, and re-evaluation of what we're doing. It's more of a uh, personalization, an update, a refresh, uh, making it more poignant and, and really making sure it reflects the values of us as a district and us as a community, the 191 community. So with that, um, what I'm going to do is bring up on the, on the screen, uh, so what you have in your, in your packet there, it says draft for vision and values. This is the um, draft vision and values that have been updated after the thought exchange and after the um, in-person meetings that I conducted this over the last week. Uh, in that section, you'll see some notes about why we, uh, why some of the changes were made uh, and um, based on the feedback that we got. Uh, and I'm gonna put up on the screen actually the um, draft vision and values. Actually, I'm gonna start with the current strategic roadmap. And this is a document that you are all probably pretty familiar with, but just as a reminder, uh, it includes kind of uh, four parts, our mission, each student future ready, community strong, our core values, uh, what's called Vision 2020, and then strategic directions. And um, what I want to note about this is that the draft vision and values that you have before you are, are quite a bit different in style and substance from the vision and values that are on the strategic roadmap. And that's intentional. That came out as part of the process. The vision um, uh, in particular is much less tactical. It's much more aspirational. That's the goal of the vision is to sort of set out this, who do we want to be? What do we want to do? Um, in the future. If we're doing everything right, what does it look like? 
Um, and so it is much more aspirational. It's a big change. The core values are also different. Um, one thing that came out loud and clear in the fall input sessions was that people wanted to know that this reflected us and our uniqueness, um, not uh, values that you might necessarily see any, at any school district or any organization, um, not necessarily personal values that we expect everybody to have, but mm -hmm. values of the district, the core values that really are the foundation of the work that we do and the lens through which we do our work um, for students. So that's, that's kind of a little overview of why there's such big changes there and, and what those look like. Uh, now I'm going to switch to showing the uh, draft vision and values as they were presented to the thought exchange. Nope, that's not it. So um, I know this might be hard for some of you to see because back, your back is to the screen. Um, so I apologize for that, but well, I'll, I'll kind of try to talk my way through it a little bit. What we heard in the input um, about the vision and values this, in the thought exchange this spring, one of the main things about the vision was, uh, one, that it, uh, the, it should be uh, more focused on academic, um, more focused on yeah, academic challenges or academic rigor, uh, that it should also be maybe a little simpler, that the original version that we brought out to the thought exchange was um, not just a little wordy, but uh, not organized, needed to be developed in a little bit different way. Um, so what the new uh, draft vision reflects is that reorganization, uh, also replacing one word, uh, the second sentence originally read, um, students will be equipped to meet Oh, no, I'm sorry, we originally read students will embrace the dignity of all people and welcome diverse and instead change that to humanity um, since that's kind of more the essence of what we we're getting at. And um, again, as I said, a greater emphasis on rigor. So the draft statement that you have tonight, um, there are two different versions. One, I'll just go ahead and read it as either we will be a school district that provides transformative learning experiences that mirror students' own stories. Students will be equipped to meet rigorous academic challenges that build their capacity to pursue excellence, embrace the humanity of all people, and welcome diverse perspectives and voices, and be supported by a caring community that sparks their curiosity and fuels their progress down a self-determined path. So that's it in one version as just all as one sort of paragraph. Uh, and then the second version is, is broken out, same words, um, but broken out with some uh, bolding and some bulleting to kind of clarify that organization and maybe make it a little easier for people to take away that information. And then I'll, I'll just mention the core values as well. Um, we did one of the things that you'll see, the other item that I included uh, in your packet is a report about um, takeaways from the top, uh, from the thought exchange this spring. So top thoughts, and some analysis of those thoughts, of all the thoughts. Um, one of the things is we did get mixed input, I would say, not, uh, over, not evenly split necessarily, but we did get some mixed input about the prioritization of core values. Um, there, there wasn't a, you know, all agreement all the time by people and we wouldn't expect that necessarily. Um, but there was a common ground, you can see it on page, it must be page four of the report, some common ground around um, embracing diverse paths for students, that individuality, that personal growth, uh, focus on academic excellence and rigor, uh, ensure, ensuring inclusion is a core value, being a, an inclusive community, uh, and uh, again, emphasis on future readiness. There was, the areas where there was some disagreement were around support for the district's cultural proficiency. Um, the majority of, of uh, of people who support, or the majority of respondents and participants did support, were supportive of our uh, work around cultural proficiency. Um, not that, that uh, that's up for debate as to whether or not that's what we're going to do, um, but there was some disagreement around that, and that's worth noting. Uh, but uh, there was still very strong support for that, and especially among staff and students, I would say that there, that support was very, very strong. Um, so when you look at the, the core values as they are now, some of the changes that we made after the thought exchange and, and feedback were to 
uh, first um, just put them in alphabetical order, not try to prioritize them. Um, these are all equally foundational to our work. And so we're just going to put them in alphabetical order. Uh, we did change one in particular, the um, caring community core value. Uh, we removed a, a reference to joyful pursuit of learning um, because uh, some of the feedback that I heard was that uh, that wasn't representative of everybody's experience and, and even moreover that that wasn't necessary uh, as not everything we do is going to be joyful. Some of it's going to be hard and uh, that's why the caring community is there to help us overcome those obstacles. Um, so that change, um, let's see. Uh, also, the description in there originally said um, our culture will actively encourage and embrace each student, creating a sense of support. Uh, we changed that to say each member of the community. Uh, this was feedback specifically from staff members who felt like it was important that we include staff members as part of this. And that we're not just supporting students, but the culture supports all, all members of the community. And. Um, those are the primary the primary changes uh, to those to the core values. Um, so I, I guess I'll just kind of leave it there and open it up for, or uh, hear your input and welcome your discussion. Thank you, Aaron. Um, board members, I have several questions. Yep. <laughs> um, it looks like um, there's a large percentage of because if it's looking at race that answered were white, how was there any effort made to get more um, uh, BIPOC and um, community involved in yep. this? Yeah, I mean, it's in like a, you know, surveying them or getting involvement or input from BIPOC community. Yeah, we we did uh, uh, the thought exchange was available in multiple languages. People could change the language that they had. We sent out invitations in different languages as well, and I did in, um, engage the liaisons about trying to reach out to families. I think that the format that we did in terms of again family representation, this online format, I th I think has its shortfalls, and that's one of them is that um, we struggle in particular to reach, I would say, more uh, non-English speaking families, that that's the biggest struggle, um, or where English isn't their first language. And um, uh, so that is a struggle and a, and a shortfall, I think, of some of the results. And that's part of the reason why I met with cultural liaisons in particular, was to hear what uh, they felt they heard, have heard from families and ask them to sort of represent those families. Okay. Um, it, it's not perfect, I, I wouldn't say okay. it was perfect. Um, the representation, I don't know if this breakdown, it wasn't in this part of the report, um, but I did ask for a breakdown um, uh, by race and ethnicity by role, and our representation among students was actually pretty good, okay. um, pretty close to reflecting um, the makeup of our students at the secondary level. Um, and uh, of staff members, it was overwhelmingly white. That's fa frankly fairly reflective of our staff members. Um, and at, uh, uh, among families, again, it was less than I would expect. It was something like, and I don't have it right in front of me, but it was something like 27% or 30%, 70% um, who answered that they identified as white, and then 30% who uh, identified not as white, either refused to or declined or said um, one other category. So it, it wasn't, uh, we definitely didn't get there. Part of it was skewed, I think, also because the representation of staff members is so overwhelmingly white. Okay. And then for the group that was unfavorable towards the cultural proficiency as a core value, so this survey, it, was, it went out to just district families it, it was the, a, into a community as a whole. It was available to the community as a whole. We shared okay. it with some key communicators as well, primarily. And, it, and I want to be clear, it wasn't a survey. Um, it's a thought exchange. So it, oh, thoughts. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it was more like... So people have a chance to interact with each other's thoughts, not uh, directly replying, but rating thoughts and, okay. and offering their own thoughts uh, around it. Um, but uh, it was available to members of the community. I, I, don't know how many people identified just as members of the community off the top of my head, but uh, it was open more broadly. So it, that could represent just people outside of like our dis, actual district. 
Oh, it, it could. I, I would hesitate schools. to guess that that's okay. why it was like that. I, I think it's probably mostly people who live in our community. Okay. Anything that's else? It. That's all I had. <laughs> okay. I would ask um, on that same point, how, how did we define cultural proficiency in, in before starting the conversation? Um, just the use of the words, or did we give any kind of uh, framework? Because uh, in reading this comment, stop teaching students to see color, I mean the teaching and culture, that has nothing to do with cultural proficiency. Correct, correct. And so clearly there's an misinterpretation. Cultural proficiency is about understanding the world we're in. It doesn't mean you have to agree with things or, or you know, whatever, but it, 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 I mean, it's the equivalency to having a driver's license before you get all go out and drive on the road. So. Right. Um, I wonder how we defined it because it feels like the responses that were negative were probably misinterpreting the, the intention of, of what that what, what we do with cultural proficiency. Yeah, other other than um, a link to you know in the original input links to the strategic roadmap and links to some other information on our website so that people could have some understanding, and other than the um, description that goes along with the each uh, core value as it's drafted in here. We really didn't. We really uh, just opened it up to for people to provide their own thoughts. And, and that's fine. This is not a, that was not, I didn't mean that to come across as a um, judgment of how we did the process. It was more putting the responses in context. Uh, so uh, thank you. Other questions or comments? Well, I was just going to make a comment too on the cultural proficiency um, statement also that's on here. Um, kind of using the word, uh, assumptions is okay, but kind of using the word biases kind kind of um insinuates i mean it has a negative connotation that um i don't really know how to explain it but anyway i i, I that statement to me also isn't quite the way we should word it i think it's my opinion and I think, and I don't know if Amina is still here or not, but I, I think that some of the language around the cultural proficiency uh, core value is, is really tied to our actual cultural proficiency work. And so it may come from that. I'm not positive. Um, but I, I know I hear what you're saying, I think, in that people definitely, some people will have a negative uh, reaction to just hearing the word bias. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. If you want me to, to just kind of oh, chime in about that, Aaron? There's Amina. Go sure. ahead, Amina. Go right ahead, I was going to say, I think that's one of the underlying tenets that we all have biases. Yep. And right. that's yeah. part of the work. You have to understand that. Right. So go ahead, Amina. Yeah, I, I was going to say the exact same thing. That part of the way that we um, do the inside out journey is recognizing that each of us brings our own perspectives and uh, each of us holds our own set of biases biases based on our experiences and our journey to um, to where we are. Perspective sounds better. But anyway. Yeah. I what yeah. I appreciate about all of this is that it, what you said at the beginning, it feels very specific to 191. It doesn't feel like generic school school district vision statement that you pull off a pull off the google it and put it pull it off the internet and slap onto a bumper sticker or something it's really feels very specific to our district which i really appreciate i'm happy to hear that yeah oh I, well, I appreciate all the work that yeah. you put into um you know defining our, trying to define our district because it's it's hard <laughs> i think <laughs> and yeah I think also making a comparison between where we were and what's proposed here um, and understanding that this was mostly internally created. Um, the richness of this proposal um, just clearly demonstrates what we're able to do mm -hmm. when we connect with our students and our parents and our staff rather than doing something internally. And I, I know that it, it's been a huge undertaking for you and um, CISO and your team, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but this is, I really appreciate um, what I'm seeing. And I think it is, to Scott's point, it, it really does, um, you know, it does a great job of capturing who we are. And it's a great aspiration and far less technical 
than this, and I think this is this is where we need to be. I mean, this this new proposal is where we need to be, and and in terms of you know the draft vision statement, whether it's you know all one paragraph or bulleted. Um, as someone with aging eyes, I prefer I like the bullets because <laughs> I'm able to just see them and kind of commit them to memory that way. But wherever you land with that, it's you know. It's well, I definitely prefer the bullet points. Also, I was going to say that. Yeah. And as someone who's dyslexic, I prefer them too. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be posted on our website once it's completed. Yeah, so the, the next step of the process, actually, this, this coming week, we'll um, post something on the website just saying, uh, you know, sharing it more broadly uh, with the community that it was shared as part of this work session, that you've uh, spent some time reviewing it, discussing it, and that the plan is uh, to bring it forward on the May 27th meeting for your approval, and then it will become part of our uh, district roadmap, our strategic roadmap. Um, and the next part for, for your um, information, I think I shared this last week or three weeks ago as well, uh, but also for the public. Um, the next steps would be then to uh, go through a, a, some process to identify this new strategic directions, uh, if we need to update our strategic directions as well. And that would probably be a primarily internal process because we're talking about how to do the work that needs to get done. Um, and, and so that would be more uh, district leadership and school leadership um, working on that. And then the dashboard after that? And then the dashboard after that, these are all kinds of, they're sort of dominoes that are falling at the same time um, rather than one right after the other because that goes along with the uh, uh, review, the systemic review, right, of our finances and, and our spending and everything else like that. So. Yeah, yeah, good point. I just have one more thought, though. Um, yeah. Because I, I know, like, from the in, original um, um, plan, I know um, as a parent of a kid who has learning struggles. I didn't necessarily see my kid in that vision statement often, um, but I do see it a, a little more represented here. Um, but when it comes down to the last core value, um, intentional agency, when I see agency, I think it's what the district or the staff are going to do, but then it starts with our students are going to, so it's not really reflected of the agency is how I'm interpreting it. So I'm like, it's a, you know, there's that, the agency in this. <laughs> that, that came up in uh, a discussion actually with staff members as well, that the word agency uh, in this case is a verb. So it's, it's them, it's in the intentional ability to choose what you do for yourself, your ability to act on the world outside of you and yourself as compared to like the agency, which might be the district is a noun agency. Um, and it's, it is, it's a little bit clunky of a word. Um, uh, and so I've been thinking about that, but I'm not sure what the solution is just yet. Um, I but, think that maybe it's because all the other kind of words after the other ones, the, the second words, you know, like community isn't necessarily a verb for caring community. It's also a noun. Right. You know, so I think that's where my reading goes. Yeah, absolutely. Interpretation. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I don't yeah. know if it should maybe be a different word or mm -hmm. <laughs> the mm -hmm. value uh, itself. What we're trying to capture is what you hear and best practices for elevating student voice, that they have a voice, um, but they sometimes don't have the skills to advocate and to formulate the voice. So that's what the verb is. You're trying to give, give them the skills mm -hmm. to voice. So yeah, trying to give them that agency. In, so that's good to hear this feedback. Yeah. Uh, I may open a thesaurus and see what we can do. Because <laughs> we all know students have voice. Yes, that's exactly it. Uh, this summary document includes um, the appearance of a couple of links for deeper dive information. Where can we get the digital copy so we can follow the links? I'll include them in the update to the board tomorrow, the document that you guys get the weekly update, and then we'll include them in the public announcement uh, of this as well so that um, we're sort of closing that loop accountability-wise with the people who participated in the thought exchange. And that's just basically a link to the, to the thought exchange as it exists now, which is that it's closed, but you can still review all of the um, thoughts that were exchanged, I guess. All right, and then on the, the vision statement um, towards the end, through excellence, embrace the humanity of all people, welcome diverse perspectives and voices, and be supported by a caring community that sparks their curiosity and fuels. I'm gonna unpack that statement a little bit. I, it, when I first read that, I'm still struggling. Be supported 
So our vision is to be, I mean, I'm trying to understand how we, how this vision statement, um, are we saying we accept a caring community or somehow we are going to make sure there's a caring community? Yeah, we're, I think what um, it, each of those bullet points starts with where students will. Um, that's the predecessor there. So it's, it's we will be a school district where students will be supported by a caring community. So that's the vision that, we'll, that we will be in the future. And I was interpreting that as the caring school community, not the larger community necessarily outside of the school. And I was interpreting it exactly the opposite. Uh, that's that's what I thought you meant. the that's home life I that we're that, talking right. about here. And mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. I'm just trying to understand yeah. our impact on the community. Are we encouraging a, a, a community? Are we actively going out and ensuring there's a community? Um, what, you know, what statement are we hoping there's a community and want to embrace that one that does? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I, th I think I interpreted, I think the intention is for it to be all inclusive. So th this is the kind of uh, school district will be it, where there's a community that supports all students in their growth. Um, we'll obviously uh, really, really have a, a big influence on what happens in the schools. And then through our partnerships in the community, through our partnerships with families, we'll have a big influence on the community as well. And. Um, you know, so it's it's a, I think I've interpreted it as being all inclusive. Obviously, it's the community we provide at the schools and and in the programs and here at the district for staff as well, and um, but also the community we create with our partners beyond beyond the school walls. I guess my concern is that I mean, we've kind of if you look at the bullet points, it's like a three legs, right? Students will be equipped to meet rigorous. Act well, we can we can control that. That's a controllable element. We'll equip them to re to to meet rigorous academic challenges. They, uh, students will embrace the humanity of all people and welcome diverse. We can control yeah. that through you know, the processes we use and the culture we create. We'll be supported by a caring community. I don't know how much we can control that. And I'm not suggesting we don't want to. I'm just suggesting that that's a stretch goal for us as, a, as one element of the community. See, I read that as kind of a nod and recognizing, of course, that our district spans three cities. Um, this is a, a gentle nod to the caring community as it's defined by the city of Burnsville, um, which is our lar largest city. Um, and so I felt comfortable with that because I know that it's, it's part of, and, and I'm not as familiar, unfortunately, with the city of Savage and the city of Egan in terms of, you know, what their perspectives are um, and what their statements are in terms of their caring community. I imagine that there probably is something in there too. But I think it's fair to have an expectation of a, of a caring community. I, I mean, we can't control it necessarily, but we can encourage it, and we are. And a vision statement is aspirational. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any. Well, I'm hearing, uh, just to clarify, I'm hearing that uh, pretty much people are comfortable with the uh, core values as they stand. Uh, some question, especially around maybe intentional agency and looking to see if there's a clearer way to um, communicate that. Um, the draft vision statement, I'm hearing that the second version with the bulleted points uh, is, is the preferred at this point. Um, is there anything that I'm missing, other updates that we need to, that I need to be looking at? The cultural proficiency, you might want to just leave out the word biases. Because if I look at it that way, other people will too. I disagree. You, you <laughs> I'm you, sorry, I disagree. You, you disagree? I do, yeah. I think it's, if, it's, if it's structured based on our cultural proficiency foundation, I think it, we need to be in alignment with that in our vision. And yes, bias is uncomfortable. And no, it's uncomfortable. I'm not saying that maybe... Um, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be, that we shouldn't reference it. I'm just saying you can use a different word. Yeah. And There's I, other words for biases. Yep. That's all I'm saying. I'm fine with Just bias. to clarify. Yeah. I, I would. Or leave it out. I would need some consensus. I feel like before I would be able to bring a, an updated version through. So I think that is a core word at the core heart of what cultural proficiency in the process is. I mean, the book opens up with the talk about biases. Um, I assure you, I understand what you're saying, Tony. It was the hardest part of that book for me to read as a from the person I am with the background I am to, to mm -hmm. accept that I come with biases. But 
It's okay. a core part of cultural proficiency. Mm -hmm. I think people need to get more comfortable being having uncomfortable conversations. Yep, nothing wrong with that, but you also, you just have to realize there's different points of view and I'm here to give you a different point of view of how other people may think, right. you know? <laughs> so I'm just telling you. And you may not want it, and it could possibly be a little offensive to some people. I'm not, you know, I'm just saying. So that's my, my input as my part of the board to just tell you that other people think differently. Absolutely, and we saw that in the thought exchange as well. I mean, that, that came across very clear, so I appreciate that. All right, well, thank you very much. I will uh, uh, update these and um, put them in the board packet for May 27th. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, we're down to the last item on the agenda this evening. Um, I, I tend this to be fairly quick. Um, so I'll, there's a little bit of a learning curve to get you guys, some of you up to speed because there's been some conversations with uh, Director Chester and I in our role as officers with Dr. Battle. Um, and so um, as you probably are aware, Director Werb has 20 some years of experience in the insurance industry. Um, and I should preface this by saying, you know, um, we get a report, um, a very thorough report once a year from our broker uh, on insurance. Um, and it's frankly probably more than most of us can digest in the evening. Um, and then we usually vote after that on whether to proceed with the recommendations. Um, not being an expert in the, in the field, um, it's challenging to um, make much more than an interpretation than ask a few simple questions. Are we losing money? Are we, are we protecting the interests at hand, et cetera, like that. Same time, this is one of our most expensive uh, items in our budget. And so we are afforded a, a unique opportunity that Director Werb has this background and she has had some interest in, the, in understanding better the, what's going on with uh, the insurance program that we administer here at the district since it is uh, self-administered. Uh, um, so she brought some of those concerns and questions to me. We, 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 she worked with Dr. Battle uh, through some of that. Um, and in the process, I thought, you know, there's a monthly committee that's meeting to review insurance. Um, maybe Director Werb could help and work with them. Um, and that was basically the innocuous, you know, the very uh, innocent thought I had at the time. After reviewing and talking with other folks about it, it, it became obvious that that probably wasn't the most appropriate place for a board member to be sitting. Um, and I accept that, and we drew back that consideration, but we still want to entertain the opportunity for Director Werb to uh, have a little bit more involvement and, and understanding so she can be our lens and we can gain from her experiences. So my recommendation would be that we would um, instruct Dr. Battle uh, and uh, her staff and, and our broker to meet with Director Werb on a, uh, a, a, a regular tempo that they determine is appropriate to review what's being talked about in this committee, um, review uh, questions that, doc, or that Director Word might have, and then Director Word can bring back that information in some form for us to, uh, for better digestion. So that's where we're at. I throw it out for any concerns or questions. Uh, we wanted to have a table level conversation about this. So. <laughs> It's very rare that um, we have experience, you know, professional experience on board in such a significant area. I mean, I think there are so many, um, so many other areas that, that perhaps we could dabble in it. Now, I don't believe that it would be appropriate, but I think that given the fiscal responsibility to ourselves and to our staff, um, we're really blessed to have, to have Anna step willing to share her expertise with us and willing to invest her time. Um, so I think, you know, if it's, if it's workable, I'm perfectly fine with that and, and would look forward to, to seeing what, what we can do with that. Any other thoughts or inputs or? Concern? I agree with Director Alt. I wanna be very, very clear that our interest here is to ensure that those that are being served by our 
health insurance plan are getting the most bang for their buck. Those are our teachers, our administrators, our employees. It's our responsibility as elected officials to ensure that the money we can afford to spend on it is spent in the most usable and proper way. And so uh, having the, uh, you know, the experience that Director Werb has and can bring it to the table as a neutral, she's, she, like us, is not covered by this insurance program, so therefore, you know, can bring an outside perspective into it also, so. I think there's also, um, you know, in terms of, again, just uh, taking a fresh look at, you know, our, um, you know, the consultant and, you know, do we, do we want to consider um, on a more regular basis, just, you know, sending out RFPs to, you know, to make sure that we're getting the best, you know, not saying that we're not getting the best possible support, but um, I think it, it's our responsibility also just to, you know, make sure where we are. Okay. Well, I um, see. I, 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 Go ahead, please. I, I agree to a point. I just get concerned whether or not we cross a line between our board governance and going into operations. And mm -hmm. I and I want to be cautious that that line is not being drawn. Um, uh, you know, and as much as I appreciate each of us having different um, levels of experience or expertise in certain areas, mm -hmm. it's also kind uh, of be, you know, like it's, if you're not reelected or you choose not to go again, then we wouldn't have it, you know, as a consistency factor either. Yeah. Well, and it might be something that we would, I, I think it's, it's brought up a great conversation that maybe we should have had before, you know, whether we have the experience or not, this is significant. And, you know, uh, Eric, to your point, you know, it's our responsibility to, to educate ourselves. So, you and know, I it, can certainly share knowledge. I mean, th this is important to have, especially in this day and age with healthcare costs mm -hmm. only rising. Um, there's certain factors that, you know, I think a lot of people don't really understand. A lot of people focus on flat costs. And um, when I talk about flat costs, I mean, that's going to be your admin and your, um, your, your, your things like your um, stop loss. Those are your flat costs. And they don't look at things like claims costs and where you can get discounts on things like provider negotiated fees, which are huge when you compare administrative costs to claims costs, which administrative rates are like 500,000 a year compared to 17 million for claims. You could be saving millions of dollars on cutting claims costs by negotiated rates on um, provider discounts when you know your, um, your consultant is only focusing on flat Flat, cost, flat rate costs, and they're not looking at the bigger picture, which is, you know, your negotiated rates with providers. So that is a big deal. And Leslie, I, I do share your, you know, I want to, I do want to make sure that we stay above the line. Um, I think in terms of the contracts um, for these, you know, f that are related to insurance, I think it is certainly within our, um, our realm to, to look at those and review those. Well, thank you, Anna, for being willing to share that info, that your expertise in this. Sure. Okay. We have consensus. With that, we will uh, end our evening. Thank you. Yep.